Well, hey everybody, welcome back. We are doing Calc One Product and Chain Rule today. Two of the um, most important things you'll probably ever do in Calc. And I got a little bit of cough today, so I'm going to be muting my mic off, and so you're not having to listen to me cough. But I do got some coffee here, so hopefully that'll be okay, and my voice won't go give out. Uh, these are not easy topics, Product and Chain Rule. If you haven't really learned about them before, so this is not to to teach you guys the Product and Chain Rule. This is more of of a review. And it's, again, more for my edification and just my going back and relearning some of this stuff and kind of seeing if I can regurgitate it like I used to be able to do. And if people want to listen, great. If they want to join in, even better. Um, but, again, I'm just kind of doing this for myself. Don't take me as a math person. I'm not a mathematician. Uh, not by any stretch of imagination. So my my what I'm saying is not gospel, but we'll see if we can get through this. Anyways, I got uh, Midnight in here, and I got Barney. He's a stream whore and just drops into any stream we have. So <laughs> now uh, he's going to learn. He's going to learn. Hey. Oh, but this coffee is so good. And you got coffee too, right, Barney? You good to go? Yeah. Midnight, did you get some coffee? Uh, I had I before, not now, but mm. yeah. Okay. Let's do, let's do this. Yeah, we're, we're gonna we're gonna jump on into this. I am gonna be pretty much taking this right out of a wiki for the most part, um, with my own things added in from college textbooks and other things. And one of the things for the the wiki, when you go to it and you look up something like the product rule, it it does a very simple proof and does a more rigorous proof. But of course, it's not gonna explain to you you how these proofs are done. And so it's one of those things. Again, you can go to wiki is great for getting resourced information, um, but it's not gonna teach you anything. It's not going to tell you how, how these things actually work. So I'm going to be kind of going through how they did their proof and, and uh, what these things actually do. So what exactly does the product rule do for us? So let's jump right into this and go screen share. Watching so they can't tell me on the outside chat. Wait, hold on. I can check. I'm lucky. I haven't... Uh... Okay, it, it still needs to catch up. I'm pretty much talking to myself, which is okay. I'm used to that. There we go. Yeah, All right, okay. so can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so what the product rule allows it. us to do, <laughs> what the product rule allows us to do is if the, remember the composite functions we talked about yesterday, uh, F and G are, are functions. If they are differentiable functions, so the, multiple, the, the product of the functions are, are being able to be differentiated. So, if, if each individual function can be differentiated, then the product, meaning the multiplication of them, can be have can be differentiated. The way you do this, though, is a very specific way. You just don't take both functions and, and, and multiply them together and get something out of it. Um, it's not like a composite function where you take one function and you stick into another. The way it actually works out is given by this very specific formula. And what this formula is is function f of g, or excuse me, f and g, derivative of that is equal to the derivative of the f function times g plus the f function times the derivative of the g function. Now, there's different ways to write this. Here's where the confusion comes in in calculus. This has already been the issue that I had. Depending on what book that you read, depending on what video you watch, depending on what school you go to, you can have different notation, notation for the same thing. This is the primary formula. Um, the way I, I like this formula only for the fact that I can just set it up and go FG, 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 right? And then I just put in, okay, the first one is just going to be parentheses, uh, uh, this little um, apostrophe, right? Looking thing, that means prime or derivative. So I just have, okay, the first one, first term is going to be the derivative of the, fir of the first function times the second function plus the second fu first function times the derivative of the second function. So I just set it up FG, FG. FG, and then I just put the little primes in. The other ways of doing it are writing it like this. You could write it in terms of ah, a third that function. Form. Yeah, this is a third function. So this is h prime of x is equal to this right here. And then I'm just expressing it in the form <coughs> of an expanded function with the argument shown, which is x, right? Mean the same exact thing. Another way would be with a dot product. Or excuse me, not, God dang it. So this is it's not a dot product, it's a multiplication symbol. But in vector, this means a dot product, so that's why it's a dot product. But this is this is again the same thing as this. This is just called implicit multiplication, or you might have heard it as implicit multiplication by juxtaposition. This is explicit multiplication. Same thing. Then we go into the the more um, verbose ways of writing things. This is uh, Leibniz notation. And this is D 
over dx of u or v equals u dv with respect to x plus v du with respect to x here. So this is a, this is a very common way of writing it, and I like this particular way of writing it because it actually shows you what you're taking the derivative of, and it helps in differentials. But the, the prime but notation here like, is do, more. Do, do, what's that? Do, do, do you like do you like the d the d over dx, or do, do you like f of a f prime? I I can't really, I couldn't really see. Uh, I like the d over dx, but it doesn't really matter because there there is um there. It, it, you can switch back and forth, and there's different reasons to use different ones, I think, right? Some notations are easier to use for certain things, and then for longer works, compact notation. And actually, you know what? I even forgot the notation here. I was trying to come up with different notations that I could think of. Did, and we'll, when I'm done, there's one more notation that I forgot. We'll see if anybody can, can note it. Um, but this one, this one's next one called the D notation. This is just saying D, the derivative of Y with respect to X, is equal to the derivative of Y with respect to U times or multiplied by the derivative of actually no that shouldn't be times that should be plus in there shouldn't it yeah that has to be plus okay so yeah, then, um be uh, the derivative of u with respect to x and then the next notation is differentials right this little dv here or du those you'll see a lot in differentials when you're doing the differential um <coughs> different diffy q differential equations um when you just say <coughs> what a differential is used for is uh, let's say you, you have a, a ball bearing, and I want to know how much of that ball bearing is left after it's being worn down, right? Well, the one of the ways I can do that is I can take a micrometer and I can measure across the ball bearing and across the x axis. I can take a measurement across the y axis, and then I can take um, an average of that, and that'll give me an average of what my average, somewhat average, of the diameter of the ball bearing. I could then use the formula for volume. And I can take the derivative of that, and I can stick in the error measurement of my micrometer because it's usually about 0 .0, um, 0, is it 0 0.01 or 0 0.001 millimeter? I think is the, the error measurement for 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 micrometer. It's either 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. I honestly don't remember, but that error measurement has to be fact in because when you when you take an error measure when you're just taking a two dimensional measurement across the the diameter, right? Even in, even in uh, two planes, X and Y, when I take the volume and to find out the whole volume of the, of the thing, I have to factor in that micrometer's error measurement because if I say it's five millimeter, well, it could actually be 5.01 millimeter or it could be uh, 0 .49, uh, 0.49 millimeter, right? If with a 0 0.01 millimeter uh, difference, it, could act, it has a variance in there. So it could be anywhere in the range for, from 0.499 2.501 and when I put that into the formula for my volume that's going to actually be a, a big amount that's called an error measurement propagation right so these would that's when you use differentials which we will get into at some point um, I probably should have a bad uology actually do differentials because he's probably got it closer <laughs> in his mind than I, I do so let's see here Somebody in the live stage said, aren't you preaching this math to the choir? Yeah, this is all review stuff for most people, Madness. Um, this is not meant to be a first experience, you know, first thing to, to a person where they have never experienced math before. However, it does get them exposed that if they do later on get into math, they'll at least know what some of these things are. So it gives them kind of a leg up. But it's basically for my edification and the people in here that want to, like, review this stuff. It's just, you know, we, we can do it. So let's just, just kind of explain it. And if you want to look at it, that's great too, right? So here's the other type of notation. This is um, <clears throat> using U V notation, which is the same thing as this formula, right? It's just sticking it using U V notation and then moving the primes a little bit differently. So don't get too hung up with the notation. Think about it as <laughs> concepts because the concept of taking the derivative of the product of the two functions is basically you're taking the derivative of one function times the non-derivative of the of the function second function plus the derivative of the second function times the non-derivative of the first function so that's kind of what you're doing you do how it's written can vary but i did forget one notation here and i and i think i know how to actually write it out here jade what notation did i miss you think off the top of your head i, I don't know how to, i don't know how to write it in this particular thing. um i don't know I'm looking at I'm having 
I'm yes. making dinner, so I'm well, a little distracted. I mean, there we go. Okay, that's how you write it. So yeah. it's called Newton notation. Yes, there you go. Let's see. So, and then what the way it would work would be u uh, dot, let's see, u, v, u dot v plus v dot u. Let's see if I can stick that in there real quick. Okay, there we go. See the little dots above there? So if I did it as this notation, oh, that. u, v. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure how to write it out because I never used Newton notation. So we're kind of doing a mixture. I've never used it. Yeah. Yeah. You'll 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 very rarely ever find this type of notation. This is what we call Newtonian um, notation. So I I just had I had to figure out how to use a dot on, on this program here. Yeah, it's just called dot b. Oh. So um, here the dot is over the actual um, function that we want to take a, a derivative of. So if you see it. Something like this that could mean that that is a derivative. Now dots do stand for other things, so I don't think there's one thing fixed. But in this type of thing, when you say u notation or whatever it is, that's going to be the first derivative. If there's two dots, it's second derivative. If there's three dots, it's a third derivative. Yeah, um, you might want to mention that in in mathematics, certain letters are used for certain things, and it it can be really helpful if you're looking at something and you don't know what it is. For example, for example, if you see f and g, you you know you're dealing with functions always. And if you see u and v, you're usually dealing with some sort of differentiation. And just like when you see yeah. x and y, you're dealing with specific variables. When you see a and b, you're you're dealing with general variables, as in doing a rule. And there's or, a well, actually with, with a and b, you're you'd probably gonna be using those for constants. The lower, lower. Oh, in, yeah. well, or or for general rules. Or for like general, or for gen, or for general rule expressions of variables exactly. and general expressions. Yeah, and that's you, you you're exactly right. You can tell by the context, but you, you can tell by the context, and that's what you need to look at. Look at which letters are being used and what context they're being used. That's a great point. Context. A, a equals a. A equals a is a rule, and in that case, a is being used as a uh, you know a a, a general. Um, you know, a general constant. But if you were going to do, you know, x squared plus uh, 2x plus a, clearly that's being used as a constant there. You know, it, it's funny, you know, when we talk about context. A general variable in it. This place. is one of those Sorry. things, because people that learn math, people that learn science, no matter what type of science you take, you have to learn math. STEM, you have to learn math. Mm -hmm. There's just no getting out of that, right? That's one thing about what Jay just said, People that learn math and, and other STEM fields learn things about context. And I and I noticed that's why a lot of people that have never had any kind of math or sciences or form education, um, they really have a hard time understanding concept in, in different right. uh, in conversations. I mean, have you noticed that as well? It's kind yeah. of ubiquitous among certain people yes. in our community that have never and, had any experience with this. And, and in this, for example, we see our Ds, and we know what the D means here. But in a different context, a D could be a constant. Yeah. Constants, you know, usually start with C. And then you'll go to, like, B and A. But then you may D, use D, E, F, although E and F have other meanings, too. So you have to look at context. But understanding your co your what letters are used for what and in what context they're in can help you a lot if you run into a problem that you you find um I, i've had that happen in tests i looked at the test and wondered what in hell they were doing and then i stopped and looked at the letters okay, and, and like this, like this big d notation <coughs> excuse me um there's also what's called big o notation and uh, you'll see like an o with with um some terms coming out of it and stuff like that if you've never experienced a Taylor series, if you don't have no idea what a Taylor series is, or or um, when you do high mass with primes, you will never know what O notation is. You'll ne you'll look at this and go, what what the hell is O doing there? It's not a variable or anything. It's big O capital O, but it's called O notation. So there are different types of notations that you you may not be experienced with, but again, recognize context and then go, okay, how are they using this context? And big O yeah, notation is just used for for expressing uh, multiple terms in a Taylor series, so you don't have to write them all out. When I started studying upper math, one of the things I did was to make a list of what they were used for. And that helped me remember. Like I said, A, B, C, and D can be used for general variables in rules. Uh, X, Y, Z for specific variables in um, 
in equations. But A, B, C, and D can also be used as constants in equations. So that's that's how you, you look at these things. Yeah, um, these H, G, and X, like, like here, H of X, you, you, you generally want to reserve things like F, G, and even H sometimes for functions, yes. right? Yes. But you also yeah. see, but you also see H in matrix theory, right? You also see, yeah. you know, some of these things in matrix. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, they hey, do uh, mean Steve. different things. Yeah. Steve, uh, you know, what, what, you know, what, what, you know, how, how would you use the, 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 the product rule if you, if you had three functions? Well, you know, or, um, well, we're we're gonna get into the chain rule when we have more than yeah. a couple of yeah. functions, and and so. Um, this this you basically what you would do is you basically would take the product of two first, then take the pro, then apply it to the, th the third. So basically, you just do them in order. Um, mm -hmm. But w that's a little more advanced. But let's let's just stick with two functions right now, okay? Yeah, I just figured I'd ask. Mm -hmm. They are a lot of these things are. Um, well, I hate to use the word, but chainable. <laughs> I guess would be the <laughs> best way to put it. Okay. So well played. Let's let's start with this. So I, I'm just expressing the product of these two functions with another function. Now, if you remember with the composite functions, you took the input of one. Uh, you, took, me, you took the output of one. You put it the input of the other. Here, I'm just I want the product of the two. And again, you can't just take the product of the two and times them together. I can't just say, okay, well, if the function is two for f of x and the function is two for g of x, well, the 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 um, the product between them is four. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay. So let's actually see what we have to do here. So let's assume that f and g are both differentiatable. And and you know, do you remember what it means to be differentiatable? If I had say a function is 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 differentiatable, what does that kind of mean? Do you what do you what do you they think? Need of, a, they need to have a derivative. Yeah, they it just means I can take derivative across the function. It has no discontinuity. Yeah. Okay, it has no breaks. If there's a point in the function where it basically goes. To, uh, uh, orthogonal to the x-axis, which means perpendicular, um, that would be a zero for the, right? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, that'd be undefined for the derivative. You can't have an undefined derivative. So these functions are assumed to be differentiatable. If they're not, you can't take the product rule here. Very, very critical. Okay. And look, we got Richard uh, Bushy in the uh, live, ch live chat. Yay, Richard. He's learning math. He's getting out of his bubble from theology, and he's learning yeah, some math. Never mind. Sorry, I was just reading the chat. Yeah, General should be here. I invited him, but good for you, no, Richard. No, he said General is be better not be here. That's anyway. Moving know. on, Steve. He's, possess he's possessive of Robert. Robert is love. Robert is life. So okay, right, so we'll moving on. on. <laughs> this is where we have fun in the in the great debate community. It's not just about math. Okay, so <laughs> look, moving on. Um. Okay, we're going to prove that H is differentiable at X at X prime of X, blah 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 blah. So basically, that's the product rule, right? So we want to we want to we want to prove that H is differentiable at any point for X. We want to prove that H of X is differentiable, okay? And again, this is going to be the proof taken exactly off of Wikipedia. So if you go to product rule, you're going to see this exact proof, but they don't explain it to you. Now I'm going to show you what this is because I have it right here. This is the proof that we're going to be going over, okay? Let me blow this up a little bit so you can see it better. It looks right looks here. intimidating, but it's really not. It's just long. <laughs> it, you know what? You're right. It looks intimidating. And when my remember when I told you, remember when we first did first principles, right? I told you it's a lot of handwriting out. This is how it was in college for me. We had to write every little thing out, right? I mean, it was just some of these things did it very, very long, very, very quickly. And you could forget terms, you could forget plus signs, minus signs. Um, yeah, so when I was doing first principles in, co in college, it gets very tedious. And this is why I said I don't like first principles because you'll never use them, right? You'll never use first principles after a certain point because this is just an introduction. And after that, you start using, you know, the rules you've already established. But this is what we're going to be going over. But it is, it is kind of intimidating looking. But And if you've never seen it before, you probably won't be able to figure it out. And I'm not going to lie. I'm not honest with you guys. The third step in here. I actually was so tired the other day. I didn't know how they got to it, even though I knew it worked out. I put in a rule for mouth. I even contacted EO and said, I don't see what they're doing. I woke up today and re looked at it and said, Oh, yeah, okay, I know exactly what's going on. It was this easy today. And, but the other day, I was so tired, I couldn't figure out what they did. And then I realized, Oh, shit, I, I, I totally understand what they did. So, yeah, you don't want to do math when you're tired, just FYI. Get some sleep before a test. 
which just says, I don't believe in math. I believe in Jesus. Ah, uh, yeah. Jesus wants you to learn math, Richard. Um, uh, I mean, I know he's joking, but there are people. There are people like that, and I'm just. I had to. Moving on. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, Renee. Renee's here learning math too. We love Renee. Hey, Renee. I'm not going to make any girl jokes anymore. That's played out. But <laughs> you're awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what we're going to do is we are going to actually use some factors in here that we know for properties. This is not, this is this is again in math one of my weak points because I really never know what to put in there to make the proof work to, to what I have to add into right I understand the concepts but these are these are what the smart people do these are what mathematicians do they go, okay I can use this and, and I can actually make the proof so that's a little more difficult we are after the fact we're doing post talk analysis of the proofs but do you see this formula here we need to know that all this equals this do you see what I'm doing here midnight well, see what they did. Yeah. Uh, where is it? Okay. You you are basically using h, h prime of x equals the limit of x. Well, no, uh, no, 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 no. You're, you're jumping ahead. Right here, f of x g oh. x plus delta x minus f of x g g plus delta x. I am taking one term and then I'm subtracting the same term. I'm just saying f of x times g times this. Right. These 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 terms here. These two terms cancel each other out. They're zero, right? No matter what you put in here, whatever values you put in, it doesn't matter. It's still zero, right? This is basically saying x minus x equals zero. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. So we know that's a property, right? That's one of the properties I think that maybe uh, I think Jade will be going over, right? Um, additive identities and things like that, additive inverse. So the additive inverse here, if I, if I have x and I minus x from it, I get zero. I think we all agree upon that, right? Yeah, oh, and I would get zero. Now, just, just to add this in, if you were using the rule notation, I would say A minus A equals zero. A minus A equals zero. Right. Mm -hmm. Same thing, yeah. And A, um, what Jade mentioned earlier, there are general forms for certain rules, right? And something like A minus A equals zero is a general form. Right. And that should be, should be noted because it means you can put any value in for A and it holds true. Right. right. Okay. So, so this is a fudge factor kind of thing. It's not really a fudge factor, but it's a factoring, something we have to know about factoring in order to make this make sense to us. So from the definition of derivative, we, we went over first principles the other day. Um, Midnight, does this formula look familiar? This F, oh, excuse me, H prime of X limit. This is, looks exactly like went over in my discussion yes. with first principles, right? Now, now, but now you guys are understanding how these things build up to each other, right? I mean, if we would have jumped right into this without going over first principles, this would have been super intimidating and you've been like what the hell right would you agree yeah except for jade because jade obviously knows this stuff but most people in the live chat would be like uh, i don't get it um yeah and some people in the stream as well yeah they're doing that now you know no i'm just kidding actually everybody in my live chat here actually knows math so this is kind of review for them i think so well I but, mean, you know, I've done I've done some of this stuff before so it's kind of reviewed to me too but at the same time it isn't i uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And Brian Stevens says vector x minus vector x equals origin. Uh, and also, um, Brian Stevens, if you remember, the dot product of two orthogonal vectors is anybody? Anybody? Zero. Yes. Oh my God. How do you know that? I've dabbled in dot products before. You're, damn, dude. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's yeah, good. yeah. I don't mean to brag, but I've done a little bit of everything. <laughs> it, it. Never mind. We're not well, here to talk about me. Here's the truth. I've, I, I have, I have never experienced any of this stuff. I just Google stuff on the fly when anybody talks about it. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have, a, I have one million tabs open, and I just, yeah, no. <laughs> Jane and I were talking about the other day that that you know we, some of these people think we just literally sit on Google and get exposed to this stuff as they talk about it. I'm like, really. I like I like what Richard just said. Steve is trying to teach math and mocks people who don't get it. Well, I, no, I don't. I mock the CCP. I don't mock people who don't get it. Not at all. Absolutely, absolutely not, man. No, I, I know. I just I just found it funny. I mock the people that do not even bother to try, and then they say, then they talk about people that do understand this as if they they don't understand it. Right? They're telling people that have had an education, you guys are idiots. While the people that don't even understand simple math think they know more than PhDs. Yeah, that's a Danny Kruger effect or something similar like it. Or never mind, I'm going off topic. Yeah. But so, anyways, but let's move on. So, um, so we recognize this formula now. So, if you guys remember, 
back in my initial one of my initial presentations, this first term here, this h quantity x plus delta x is equal to actually y two, right? And then h of x is y one. So it's basically y two yeah. minus y one. It's the difference between two points in the x in the y axis. So all I'm doing here, all, oh excuse me, all they did. This is actually their proof, is that they just substituted in um, <clears throat> this uh, factoring thing. That's all they did. They said, you know, that y two minus y one is equal to zero. So these and y two and y one are the same point. So they they just they all they did was they just put this equation in the top instead. Okay, that's all they're doing. And if you remember, right, h is equal to delta x. There's different ways of writing this. So instead of having like h goes to zero or over h, you can write it as delta x. We went over that before, the same thing, just expressed differently. So here, what they're saying is as the limit of h goes to zero for this expression or this equation here, or this part of the, the equation, it goes to negative zero x, which is this zero, right? Negative zero and positive zero are zero. Um, there is no real um, uh, signage okay. to zero. It's, uh, it's an unsigned um, number, but no, you it can be positive or negative zero, and they mean the same thing. The only time you have signage on zero, uh, at Barney might probably know this. Barney, uh, Steve, wait. would you mind scrolling a little bit so the whole thing is, no, a little bit to the, oh. to the right? Yeah, got you. Yeah, until everything. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. <coughs> sure, absolutely. So, hey, um, Barney, what, do you do you do you know when you would actually have sine zero in programming? In programming. Yeah, right. there's a difference between positive zero, negative, negative zero, and undefined zero, right. and um, there there are some differences in limits, if I'm right, depending on which direction you came from it. Yeah, and Wait. that's exactly true. And then, so here's I'm the thing. When you're when you're talking about certain topics, you gotta know what your framework is, right? Because if people say in math, a mathematician would say, "Oh, there's no signage for zero, but a programmer would say, "Yes, there is." And especially, correct me if I'm wrong. It's been for a while for that program, but a lot of that would be for error management and error captures and error functions and error subjects. How can zero be negative or positive? It depends on which direction you come from. Approaching from the left, approaching from the right. But. Well, yeah, but, well, no, I get that, but where does? Never mind. Moving on. It's it's, it's just it's all you need to know that if you have if you see it, minus zero, it's literally just saying zero. Yeah, okay. it, it just it's and, 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 and technically, on, I I kind of look at like like zero minus zero is not really saying negative. <coughs> uh, I mean, not saying minus zero. It's actually <coughs> it's, it's, it's it's well, it's not really saying it's negative. It's just saying minus zero. It's just saying um, that you're approaching it from the left hand side. That's that's ah, okay. Right. It's it, yeah. It, it just just a think, wording think from me. Think, think of the think of the uh, um, the number line, right? Yeah, no, no, I, get, no I, I, I yeah, I get. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you, Jude. I do get it. Just yeah. the way okay. it's framed. Okay. Uh, yeah. the, the important thing is that it's consistent. That yeah. all of the right. rules still apply. If you write down <laughs> negative zero and multiply and divide and uh, all of the rules will still apply. Yep. Right. Nothing all right. So the, the next step in their proof. Is excuse me, is they let's see what they do here. Um, yeah, they just put it, they just put it in twice. So basically they're saying they're just putting the same quantities multiple times, okay? And the reason they did this is because we're gonna be factoring in a minute. This is and this is the step that I was like, I don't I don't see how they got this. And then I looked at it again this morning, I was like, oh, this is easy. All they did between this this step here and this step here is on this side right here, they factored out f of x. Okay. So oh, here, by the way, Steve, Steve, did you, yeah. did, 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 did you, did you mean to write G, G of X? Shouldn't it be X? Like somebody, the second line should have X plus Delta X, not, not G plus Delta X. What are you looking at? This is, this should be right out of uh, Wikipedia. I think. It, I don't I know. Think it's, uh, right. well, let's go over it first and see if it works out. Yeah. That's okay. Nice. So we know we, this, um, this right here would cancel out with this right here. So this minus this, this would cancel out with, uh, excuse me, this would cancel out with this. Oh, okay, I see what it is. Okay, so look at this middle part. These two terms in the middle, right, cancel, would, 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 uh, would cancel each other out, yeah, right, because there's a minus here. And then all you're doing is you're just sticking in between these two terms.
Is that right? Yeah. Uh, hang on. Uh, da, da, da. I, I may need to do this proof on my own later. Yeah, well, hang on. I, I see what they did. Okay, again, it has to do with factoring. This is, this is again, I'm trying to visualize in my head. I didn't do the steps. If you normally do the steps in a proof, you'll see how things are done. But since I copied this one, I had to see how they did it. Yeah. Um, again, what they did was, see this f of x right here that I'm, I'm pointing to? Uh, Can you see my pointer? Yes. Okay. No. This f of x, else? you guys want to see my pointer? Yeah, some people yeah, do, some yeah, people don't. Can I just yeah, suggest... Can I suggest in the, in the future yeah. you get a larger pointer? Um, I don't know how to do that, to be honest with you. Oh, okay. Well, you can – guess what? You can Google it. <laughs> yeah, Google it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's fun. yeah Google so it, – it's, it's, it takes time to do that, right? It'll, it'll take me five minutes to figure that out. Yeah, but anyways, I, um, I, I am going to try to get a, mat, a little writer. Um, I think I found one that might work, and I'm going to put it on my wish list. Um, and I think somebody that has offered to maybe pick it up for me, so – I'm going to be able to do this in a different style as well. I think it'll be, yeah. Uh, <coughs> you guys don't see the pointer. Steve so, Academy. Steve Academy. So, you know, if you don't have the pointer, let me see. I got. I might have a better way of doing this. So let me see here. Um, what can I Hold use here? Um, what's a good symbol to use to where my, my pointer is for people? Oh, let's type here. Here we go. Here we go. Here. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> okay, so here is what I'm talking about. So, live feed what I'm talking about here this f of x right here after here is just being factored out from these two things here I'm taking the f of x from here and I'm taking the f and x from the g the f of x of g of x leaving me just f of x with g x plus delta x minus g x right it's all I did was factoring it out and then I put in the they put in the, the parentheses so that's all they did on that particular line and then uh, let, me, let me get rid of this and put it <laughs> this is really crappy. I have to type here, wherever I'm at. Um, do you have color coding? Can you select something and yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do color, I that type, but then I have to type that in color. It's a ah. it's a form here than color. It's not like just changing the font. Well, I have to. Okay. Type in color. Are, are you in but, Windows? Yeah. Can't you just change it in Control Panel? Um, I don't know. What uh, you know what? I, yeah. Mouse cursor. Mouse settings. Let's see here. I guess. I guess. Like. I mean, I, do, this is Windows see, 10. I don't use 10. I mean, do you mouse. see? Do you see? Do you, do you see the curse? The cursor normal size. I mean, you know, because the rest of us oh, are seeing it small. Okay. Oh, okay. oh, you know what? They, I do remember in mouse you can actually um, hit Control and it just it it actually so, it, yeah here. But they, I don't know if the outside yeah, channel yeah. see that, but. Let me see if I can make it bigger here. Pointers. Do you have a selection you can use there? Text select, resize, extra large, black. There we go. All right, let's, let's just, we'll give it a shot. Is that, does yeah, that help? That's better, I it's think. Better? Yeah, yeah, and the control works. Yeah. Yeah, pushing control is not working. There you go. Yeah, years ago, I used to have a walking dinosaur as my cursor. <laughs> what do you walk oh, really? dinosaur? Yeah, you can you can download cursors from the internet, and and so oh, I, yeah, I had I it at work, and people would walk up to my computer and go, "What the fuck?" And this is my cursor. It was just a di little dinosaur that walked. It's sort of a brontosaurus kind of thing. Um, but I, you know what? I'll look into it a little bit more. Maybe there's an add-on yeah. program I can get. Yeah, look look into that. <laughs> Until I get the uh, little t uh, tablet thing. But okay, can the outside chat see the curve? When I hit control, it produces this little round thing. Does that yeah. help? But I don't know if you... Okay, yeah. Can see it. okay. Yeah. There we go. Awesome. So here, right here, and here, all they did was they, they did the same thing. They factored stuff out. Right. Okay, so they factored out here. They, what oh. they did is they factored out this G, this quantity, G times... Uh, or the actually the function g x plus delta x from here and here and they just factored this out and this is what's left over and the f of x so uh, excuse me all they do is factoring so anyways let's let's actually go on to the more meat and potatoes you guys can figure out the factoring um, <laughs> yeah. this, this is where you actually apply the property of limits now we didn't really go over the properties of limits I explained them at one point right but we didn't really go over them too much some of these are pretty self-explanatory. Um, the property of limits, for example, here, the product of two functions, the limit as x approaches a, you can actually separate them. You can just say, okay, 
the, the limit of the product of these two functions is going to be equal to the limit of one function as x approaches a times the limit of the other function as x approaches a. Okay, not too, not too difficult. You're just separating them out. Same thing with addition of subtraction. If you add these together, this will be addition. If it's subtraction, you subtract them. So the, the difference between two functions, the limit is equal to the limit of one function minus the limit of the other function. That's it. Really, really not that complicated. But these are two properties of limits. We did go over those the other day if people watched. So when they end up with this equation here, okay, what's happening is that they're just breaking this equation down by using these properties. They're saying, here I have one. Let me go up here. Here's, the, here's one term, right? Uh, one part of the function. Uh, I mean, so one part of the equation times another part of the equation. Remember, terms are technically... Um, Ter terms are separated by plus or minus in algebra, by the way. Okay, so all they're saying is the limit of this times this is equal to limit times this equation times the limit of this. That's it. And then they're doing the same thing here. You have a plus sign, and then you have f of x times this bracketed group here. And they're saying, okay, the limit of f of x here is times the limit of the group here. That's it. That's all they're doing. They're just breaking it down. This makes it a little more wieldable, right? This makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on than, than this. Would you agree, Midnight? If you just look at this, right, if you break it down into the limits and you end up with this, I think this is, even though it looks a little more complicated, it's actually a hell of a lot simpler to think about, yeah. right? Because now that we understand limits, right? Yeah, so, because uh, you do the derivative of the first times the, times the limit of, I, yeah, I get yeah, it. Yeah, 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 uh, because once you start taking the limits, you'll see exactly what's going on here. Yeah, and then, you know, that, 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 that makes sense. So you have the derivative of f times times g plus, I get it, yeah. It, okay, so what it's happens? It's hard for me limits. to get into. Well, let's do the limits, right? This part right here, you, get, you would recognize this equation here as first principle, right? This is exactly yes. the form that we would use, right? Y2 minus Y1 over delta x. So with x, so delta x approaches zero, right? And here you have the same thing as delta x approaches zero and delta x approaches zero. So what happens is um, the, these start going away, okay? And what do you, what do you end up with? If, if, if I have, like, for example, here, what's the limit of f of x as, as delta x goes to zero? Oh, it's just f of x. It's a constant. Uh, del, delta x has nothing in here. There's no delta x in here. So this is a constant. So I'm left with this f yeah. of x. Yeah, and the here, deltas just leave. Yeah, and right here, what happens is delta x goes to zero. Well, this just goes to zero. I'm left with g of x. So yeah. here, right, this very this first thing right here, we recognize this as the derivative, right? This is the first principle. This is the the, the definition of a derivative. Yeah, so Steve, I don't want to get I don't want to get too ahead, but try try proving the quotient rule. We are doing the quotient rule, but not not today. Well, yeah, I know. I just I didn't yeah. mean today, but yeah. Well, product chain rule. Then I'm gonna do the quotient rule. So, anyways. So this right here is, is literally the definition of a derivative, f prime, right? So f prime of x, this is this is this equation here, by definition. Times what happens in this what happens in this part in L of G? What I just told you. What what goes away here? The, the delta x. The delta x, leaving me limit g of x right here. So I am I'm, I'm left with the derivative of f prime times g of x. Plus so what happens here? What am I left with? Just the f f of x. Yeah, f of x, right. Because delta x, now, again, think about it. It's not x goes to zero. It's delta x goes to zero. Well, delta x is not even in the argument here. It has no, nothing to do with it. Yeah. So it's just f of x that, that leaves me with. And here, this is the same thing as here, only using g as a function rather than f. So what happens here? This is the derivative of g of x, right? Yes. By definition. <coughs> so wait a minute. Wait a sec. Let me finish. Okay. One sec. So does this equation, right, f prime of x, um, the, the h of x, what we're trying to solve here, does that not look like the very first equation here? Yes. Because these are the same thing. So h of x, h prime of x, I, I guess I could have thrown this in here. They they didn't include it, but I'll, I'll, I'll put it in here for clarification purposes, but... Uh, Oops, that monk symbol. Um, 
Okay, so I've just we've just, they just proved that h of x prime is equal to this. And again, that's exactly what we're trying to do up here. That h prime of x is equal to this. Okay. See where my cursor is? So this is what we're trying to prove. And we ended up with this. There now, Steve, that's how that's the proof in the product rule for Wikipedia. Go ahead. Okay, you know, you know, I was, I was just gonna ask you, you know, you know, you know, would it, you know, what would it would it be a fair question to ask as to why it's done this way? What do you mean? Like, why, why, okay, why? you know, like, you know, why, why, you know, why, why, why is it an f prime of x times g plus f of x times the times? You know what? Uh, I, I, you know what? That's a great question, actually. But I'm going to give you as a homework assignment. I want you to take two functions. Take two functions. Just um, like x squared. Any? Yeah, pick anything you want. But I mean, use something with with kind of a exponents because that way you kind of get the idea. Yeah. Um, and just take take them individually, and then take the sum them together, right? And they take then take the derivative of that and see if you get the same answer as if you do it this way. Because you're wrong. homework? Take two derivatives. Take two functions. F of x. Let's say x squared. G of x. Take two of x squared. Okay. Yep. And again, I'm just throwing these numbers. I don't. I, I'm not sure if, <laughs> what what how you would do this exactly because I haven't done it. But um, and then take the, the the multiplication of that. Right. So two times two x squared be four x squared. Um, and then and then take the derivative of that, which would be eight x. Right. Yeah, that's not going to be the same as if you do it this format. But I don't. I, yeah, I would have to do it in a Wolfram Alpha. I just well, do it. In, no, I know, I know, I know. It's not the same. But, I'm but basically, it doesn't work out. It doesn't always. It doesn't work out the same, right? You, you, you're getting two different answers. So this actually gives you the correct derivative for taking the product of two functions. Well, yes, I know. I, I was just, I was just wondering, like, you know, why it's done like that, and how, it, how it will, how it would look graphically. Um, use Desmos and figure it out that way. The graphing program that I use, Desmos. Yes, I know. I've used it before. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. Sorry, I just figured I'd ask. Yeah, it's it's, we, it's, it's well, no, it's a great question. Um, I just I didn't get into that to show you kind of how why no. why you would get the problem if you didn't do it this way. What does okay, QED so, mean again? Uh, qua qua qua. Uh, oh. Quad demonstrandum. Yeah, quad. What is it? Uh, quad. I hate Latin. As demonstrated. It basically means it means in English it means that to which would be, to be demonstrated. Quad. Oh. Quad. Quad. Erat demonstrandum. Quad. Quad estros demonstratum. Erat. 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 Quad erat demonstratum. Erat. Quad erat demonstratum. I am showing you guys math, not Latin. So. Erat. Yeah. <laughs> quad erat demonstratum. Got it. Yay. Steve, okay, can can learn, you know what it says on my wiki? Steve can learn new things. Well, everyone that's can learn new things, but moving on. But that's my wiki skill. Yes. I have one, I have one wiki skill. Oh, okay, so anyways, yeah, quad, quad erat demonstratum. But it basically means that to be which would be, that was meant to be demonstrated or to which to be demonstrated. Uh, okay, well, so actually, you know, by the way, man, in response to your question, Brian says the reason we do it this way is because we want the right answer. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's fair enough, okay. right? Whatever. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. I mean, right, I guess so, some questions have no answers, I guess. So what we're going to do here, we're going to jump right into a little bit of trig, because we know everybody loves trig. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I'm going to tell you right off the bat. Um, Yay, let's the, hear it for trig. Oh, God. Yay, no. trig. Sorry, I had to do that. I'm going to tell you right off the bat, you will have to prove this at some point if you take trig. But just, just, just know that the derivative of sine x is equal to co cosine x. Okay, just accept it as reality. This is one of those things that you'll learn in college, or you'll learn like in nuke school. They'll say, "This is true. You don't understand why it's true. You won't understand why it's true until like later on." Okay, so just accept that it's the reality, and then you could prove it later on. It, it's it, it's not an easy proof. It's not an easy proof. So. We're going to take the function of f of x of x squared sine of x. And I'm going to have the assumption everybody knows what sine x actually is. Sine is a waveform, right? Save as a function. Yes. Uh, we are. I am going to have a presentation eventually on sine and cosine wave functions. I think it's critical because Jade is going to be doing uh, specifically on trig. And if somebody doesn't really know what cosine or sine is, then 
excuse me, um, it might, it might, excuse me, it might be difficult later on. So, yeah, we'll Jane. be drawing unit circles. Yeah, she's gonna be doing the unit circle. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, yeah, my, my, one of my favorite things, the unit circle, because everything makes so much sense from there. Yeah, yeah. If, 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 person, if you know how to draw a unit circle, you know trigonometry. You can yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm yeah, everything I'm about school. trigonometry. What, whenever I would take a test, <laughs> first thing I do <coughs> is in the corner of the paper, I draw a unit circle. Yep. Yeah, Nuke School didn't really harp on that that much, and I think it was one of the downfalls. I wish it would have more. But okay, so we want to take, we want to find the derivative um of this, okay, so the x squared sine of x. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, one of the things you asked midnight is like, what? This is a good example of your question here. What happens if I just took the derivative as you think? Of, well, you know, you might have suggested, right? If I just say, okay, if I just take the derivative of this, I get well, two x sine uh, cosine x, right? But that's that, if I just throw in the if I know sine of x of derivative of that, I get cosine x, and the derivative of x squared is two x, right? So. That what you think that the answer would be if you didn't use the product rule, right? It would just be two x cosine x. But let's see if we actually get that, okay? So, by the way, you can see that we don't. But Mina, you pay attention. You see, you see what the, you see what I'm saying. If you just did it without using the product rule, you'd get two x cosine well, x, no, right? I, mean, I guess I think my question was like why it was done like that. But Brian is just like because we want the right answer, so I'm like moving on. The well, right yeah, up. but I want to make sure that if you if you don't use the product rule, if you didn't understand the product rule, you just said, oh yeah, this is just two x cosine x, then you'd be wrong. But 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 let me ask you this, midnight. Before you go further, right? See my where my mouse is. If I if yeah. this was a plus in between there, if there's a, a binary operative addition rather than multiplication, x squared plus sine x. Could you do that derivative in your head? It's really easy. Well, yeah, it's uh, you know the the, uh, the the addition property. I think you're just adding the derivatives. Right. So what would be the derivative <laughs> of x squared plus sine x? X. Barney, I'm supposed to answer that. Well, no. Well, <laughs> and no, I want to be just x. Well, no, it would be two x, two x plus cosine Sorry. x. Yeah, two x plus cosine x. Yeah, right? two x. So this is easy, right? We don't have to apply any special rules like like this. No. But okay, so we're moving on here. So, assume that the function f of x equals sine and f prime of x equals cosine x, right? Yes, RSC got it right, but RSC smart. Yes, and you're right, exactly right. Uh, it would be two x plus cosine x. Um, so here, Didn't here's I the say that? Yeah, yeah, you're right. No, I said you're exactly right. So x squared sine of x. Here's my function. Now I want to take the derivative of that, right? Using the the product rule, right? Which again I didn't didn't show again, but it looks like this, right? Remember the product yep. rule. I want the derivative of one function times the function, another function, plus the function times the derivative of the second function. That's that's the form. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just I'm going to use a uh, Leibniz notation on this, and the reason I use Leibniz notation on this is because I think it actually shows easier what I'm taking the derivative of. Yeah, I'm, think st I'm, st I'm, st I'm starting yeah, to get well, the angle just to confuse or... everybody. Well, yeah, I, I mean, like switching notations back and forth. Yeah, I used to, you know, I used to get confused with this notation, but now it's it's it basically means the same thing. It's still derivative. Dy dx d over dx means f prime. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yes. That's. But that's I like this notation because when you start doing differential equations, dx and du and dv make a lot more sense because you can actually separate them out. Do not think of this really as d divided by dx. However, this is the caveat. Even though this is not d divided by dx, it's not. Don't think of it as d over dx division. But when you get into wow. differential equations, you can actually start separating the variables out in the differential. So dy over dx is separatable. Meaning, well, I can take the dx and move it out from the denominator, even though it's not a denominator. Don't don't think of this as a fraction, even though it acts as a fraction sometimes. That, that it, do you have a way of better explain that, Jade? You know what I'm saying, but does it, does it make sense? Yeah, to anybody? I just, just yeah. For for now, for now, whenever you see d over dx or anything similar to that, it's got a d in it or a delta in it, because sometimes there's not a d, there's a delta. It's not. Addition. Yeah. So this is okay. this. Is, do not. Here we go. I do, I know. I explain it. Do not think of this for the people that have have math that have not had math that are watching. This is not um, dx squared. Well, 
It is dx squared over dx. <laughs> this is actually, actually true. You can actually take this x squared and you yeah. can move it up here. So it's actually dx squared over dx. But yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm gonna stop over. there because you can actually oh. you can actually rearrange this and actually right. make this and into but, a differential. But for now, just look at it as as the way Steve said it is d over dx. Yeah. Not d divided by dx, it's d over dx. Yeah. Yes. Now, we, like I said, okay. when you do get a differential, though, if this was like dy over dx, you could actually separate it out and go dy equals x squared dx. Right. Which is a, right. Which means with respect to x, but. Let's treat it as f prime. Yeah. Is what it's exactly right. f prime. So, so right. anyways, I want the derivative of this, x squared, times this, right? This is the function that doesn't change, plus this function times the derivative of this, okay? Just like in the form I, uh, that's given above here back here right it's in that form so now that I have it in the correct form for the product rule let's actually do it midnight what's the derivative of x squared 2x 2x this go okay so you don't need this anymore I've taken the derivative I've got one term right this term is equal to this part of the right here or my main thing it's equal to that part and then we're gonna be doing that second part across the addition sign uh, okay, so let's do this part. Um, I don't take the derivative of x squared, right? But I take the derivative of sine x, which I've already told you is what? Cosine. Cosine x. X. And yeah. again, just accept it. You'll, you'll have to prove it later on. I don't want to do that proof. It's, it's not an easy proof. But I, do, I have I've done it before. Okay, so my derivative is equal to 2x sine x plus x squared plus cosine x. So the derivative of this formula is equal to this, right? So again, right. that's different than just saying... Oh, it's two x cosine x, right? Which a yeah. lot of I'm sure calc students make that pro make that mistake, right? They mm -hmm. don't realize they have to apply the product rule to it because this is a product of two different things. It's, it's x squared times x sine x. So this is just implicit multiplication. That's all it is. Right. Okay. And, and we all we all caught up. Do that is ahead, if yeah. you're, you know, if if you're confused by this, um, it just like you said, this is this is a product of two separate terms. You can separate them yourself when you're doing a problem. Uh, you can put a dot in between. You can put parentheses around them so that you understand as you're working the problem. You don't accidentally slip. That is a great that. point, actually. Um, you're allowed in math to it, – it's a little bit wieldy, right? But you're yes. allowed to change things to make it clear just for clarification purposes for yourself. And I want to change this, and I want to change it to this, so I know that this is x squared twice times this quantity. You're allowed right. to do that. If I want to throw in, you know, a multiplication symbol, you're allowed to do that. Yes. Okay. Or so I, don't don't I think, think that you're not allowed to. I what? would use a big dot there because that's yeah um, yeah that's the, the way pro I'd the pro it. again uh, the, um you you want to use this um. But the problem with dot that's is just, not, that's just, I'm used God to, dang it. Yeah. Not, it's, it's actually C dot in this particular program. C dot. Yeah. Um, okay. There you go. You, you, the problem there we with go. It, yeah, the problem with this is that this dot again means different things for different people. It means dot product or whatever. Right. But yeah, but you'll see this dot a lot for multiplication. So yeah, you yeah. can change these things in there. Do it. Go for it. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't and you can even you change it. So it, you could even if it if you found it confusing, you could even put parentheses around the x squared as well. Yes. Yeah, as long as you're not as long as you're not changing the order of operations, you can use grouping. Right. Yes. So so right here, looking at this, I could put parentheses around the x squared, and then put another parentheses around the sine x. Yeah. Matter of fact, Super and says it was that, mandated in his class to do it that way. You know, right. I think it's a little it's, wieldy it's, to do it that way, but it does help well, learn. If I just want to say, okay, it, I want to isolate these these. Right. Things. Okay. Let's do and it. It it works and, for some people who have difficulty. Um, understanding that these are separate and I've taught people how to do this before because it makes it so much easier for them to visualize it depends on what works for you and if yeah, you're I've doing was, it, it, and if right. you're doing it in crayon you can write it out in different colors right yes and and <laughs> so there what, what Steve just did right there see how he separated them and you can put yeah, the dot see, out of this you don't need the dot you can put uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, X or the asterisk whatever works for you to show you how separate those two terms are. And sometimes when you're first learning this, this, this is the way I would teach people, I would show people how to do this first, 
a little it's while. Like, they didn't need all the extra parentheses and stuff. They knew what was going on. Yeah, but that's it only when you was. when you get acquainted with it enough. It's it's the same principle. Yeah, in yeah, programming. yeah. Exactly. Like, right, right. Write, I, write I would write as it like clearly this, and understandably as possible while you're learning. Right. The way I would write it, I would write it like this. So you're un they're, they're, you're instructor, whatever you they're, they're, yeah. they're seeing that you yes. you're not changing anything, and you're just saying it is equal to this. Exactly. Yeah, that's how I would write it. Yeah. But again, exactly. we were able to do this in our head because we've been exposed to this before, right? Right. So okay. actually, I've actually I've never knew what calculus was was last week. I just googled it. So whatever, you know, <laughs> you know. Did you just let so. me Google that for you? Yeah, just, you know, if you don't know anything, just Google it. You'll be an instant, you know, you'll be able to do the stuff in your head. Right, exactly. yeah, right. So <laughs> if, you, if you don't know how to Google, there's a great site called Let Me Google That For You. Let me Google that for you. <laughs> yeah, you, you just <laughs> write in what you want Let me to Google, Google you. For, and had... it opens up Google and types in what you told it to search for. Hey, and then, <laughs> you know, what? I'll, Google you. I'll, I'll Google you. I'll Google you until you say Yahoo. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's do a special case. Okay. Um, the only reason I added this is because I just I think it's an interesting special case that that you will use later on, right? And that's the only yeah, reason I included right. this particular thing. So what is this yeah. saying here? This is called the constant multiplier rule. Yeah. Do you remember this notation, Midnight? What is this saying? Uh, no, uh, F. Uh, no, no, my, C. My, yeah. C. No, sorry, I don't. I don't remember those. I don't remember the symbols. Uh, okay, the middle one means element of. Element of. Uh, and R means nope. No. Set of real numbers. Real numbers. Set, right. Set of real numbers. So this means a constant as an element of real numbers, or in other words, right. a seal is a real number is what it's basically saying. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, right. you might right. see that now that Steve's got a nice fancy R there. But it's sometimes you'll just strength. see that. Right. Sometimes you will just see that as a great big R. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and it, it, that's, type, oh, that's called typesetting, by the way. That's right. the difference in typesetting, element, not notation. Okay. C element of real numbers. Okay. And yeah. yeah just, just remember the E. Yeah. It sort of looks, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's 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 a weird. Look at E. Yeah. It's a weird E. Okay. That's it means exactly element. right. All right. So C is an element of real numbers. C is a real number, and f of x is differentiable. So the function is able to be differentiated. Um, then a constant times a function is also differentiable, and its derivative is c times the product, which means the product of c times f prime of x. What this is saying, this is really actually a, fa a fancy way of saying this. Look, if I have um, c times some function, and I take the derivative, and the derivative of the function times c is equal, is going to be. Um, so it's going to be equal to the, the function, the derivative of the function times the constant plus the derivative of the constant plus the function. And all that is a special case of this. Okay, That's the same thing, only with a c instead, where c is a yeah. constant. Now, if that's a special case, right, what happens in this part of the equation? What happens to the derivative of c times f? What's well, the derivative of any constant? Yeah, the derivative of any constant is zero, right? We yep. learned that before in one of my prior things. So, mm -hmm. zero times f just goes away. So, what am I left with, midnight? You're left with uh, constant times the c times the derivative of f. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So, I mean, all this is all the, all this is saying is that I'm left with a c times the derivative of f. Okay. So let's actually let's actually go through it. Let's actually see if it works. Here's mm -hmm. my example: f x squared. I use x squared a lot, by the way, because um, it's a very simple function, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So if it works for a simple function, you you, you can kind of see how it's used for it's used for yeah. other functions. So so we have a constant that c equals two. Two is a real number, right? So it satisfies the condition of here. Yep. C L is element of real numbers. So I have a constant times a function. So I just stick in two times the function. I have um, it's two x, right? Right. Yep. Good so far. And I take the derivative of two x squared, right? And by the way, you could do this in your head before I even get to this this right here. What's the derivative of two x squared? 4x. 4x, right? We can do that ahead nowadays, by the way, which I yeah. found it funny that people who claim to be an engineer can't do that in their head, right? <laughs> <laughs> when I ask simple questions like this, it's not sharpshooting. It's not asking. Well, no, no, no. Actually, 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 I, I've asked him once. He gave me the right answer, but, you know, but then I asked him to find the derivative of ex. He's like, I don't know. Yeah. 
the X. I'm like, what? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, the derivative of e to the X is e to the X, which I, I proved <laughs> the other day, right? Yeah. Weeks ago. But anyways, so here we have a situation. Since we already we already know the derivative of dx 2x squared, right, is 4x, which would just be um, um, this right here, right? Z times a derivative. So, so um, I, I want to prove this right. I just say 2 times a constant of, f of the derivative of x squared. So the derivative of 2 times the derivative of x squared. Um, oh, oh, there's yeah. going to be the constant times the derivative of x squared is equal right, to 2 right. times 2x equals 4x. Yeah, yeah so, let, me that very, let me phrase that very carefully because um, so, you can't you can't just take the derivative of two times the derivative of x squared because then you get zero. Yeah, so yeah. you apply the product rule, which is here, I'm left with four x. So it's the same thing. And let me right. ask you, why do you think that's kind of useful? It's useful because you can draw things out. Mm -hmm. If I have if I'm if, if somebody says, look, I'm giving you d over dx three x cubed, right? I know. Because if I take the derivative of all this using the product rule, I'm going to be left with um, 9x squared. I could do that in my head as well. I could do the same thing by just taking the 3 out. I can draw it across this d over dx, and I'm left with 3 times d over dx. Well, what's, what's the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared. 3x squared. And then what's 3x squared times 3? 9x squared. 9x squared. Either way I do it, I get the same answer, right? That's the special case. Mm -hmm. That's why it's handy to know because I could either say I could just take this derivative and instead of applying the power rule, right, which you want to show the steps, which is going to be a little bit more wieldy, right? You'd have to go back and do it this method. No, I could just say, oh, look it. I'm just drawing the three out. I'm just taking the derivative of x cubed, giving me three x squared, and then I'm times it by the constant, right? Give me nine x squared. Either way you do it, you come up the same way. So that's a special case. Special cases are great. Yep. In, in Next, the right. chain rule, which I finally figured out how to do a little uh, bit, I guess. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you guys, you want to continue to the chain rule, or are you guys burned out? Because the chain rule is going to take more than one session, I think. This is just... Yeah, uh, I, but I'm a little... I'm tired, yeah, but... You know, we, 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 you know, we can always do the chain rule next time. Yeah. You guys want to do the chain rule next time? Because that, that kind of is a, in, a, in a class by itself, because it yeah. gets into some pretty complicated stuff that... That I mean, look look how complicated this gets pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think it's deserving of its own hangout. Yeah, so we're gonna call this. Yeah. And, and, we'll and by the way, that the, the fact that the derivative of a constant is zero comes in very very handy sometimes because you can manipulate your equations to get rid of those. Yes. 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 Yeah. And exactly. Steve knows exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the hardest thing in math that I found um, was knowing what to do to rearrange the equation in order for you to go further to do something right okay? because have, the concepts are great but if you but right. it's really difficult to manipulate formulas sometimes go ahead sorry i was just going to say i have just just for those who are listening and somebody who might want to have some fun um i have a problem that um really simple but take some figuring and manipulation the actual the math of it it is really simple because yeah you're going to be taking a, a derivative the equation is the interesting part so i'm just going to give this to you for those who want to try it what is the largest rectangle that you can fit in a triangle oh i hate in inscribing stuff well wait hold on how big is a triangle it doesn't how make big? any difference it doesn't make any difference. See, what you have to do is you have to put all your variables in there. You put the rectangle, the 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 shape of the rectangle. You know the the different the four sides of the rectangle. Yeah, no, I can see it in you my head. You're inscri you're inscribing the rectangle in in the triangle, right? The rectangle inside a triangle, right. and then you have to put the four sides of the rectangle in terms of the triangle because you know what the triangle is. That also, gives you three, that also gives you three additional triangles. Right, it, yeah. But it, so you're basically, you've got a triangle, right? And the triangle has um, three vertices, A, B, and C. Three angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, right? And then it also has the height, H. Well, I'm actually, it has three heights. H1, H2, and A. It, it has different well, heights. Well, you know what? Why don't, you do, why, why don't you do that proof in a, ha in a hangout or something? 
Okay, well, I'll, I'll just put it out there for people. Uh, you okay. know what? I'll make a post about it. Yeah. And, and then we can go try into a hangout and, ask, and, and, and try and do it. Because for those of you who don't know, whenever you're doing a max or a min problem, you're looking for the maximum or the minimum of something, uh -huh. you're taking a derivative. Yeah, and those are those are called constraint problems. Right, right. And oh, the, the, derivative, the derivative is actually very simple, but setting the problem up is the fun part to me. Yeah, I don't enjoy those, but, but yeah, no, I, I, do. Ask, uh, I do. We've all had to do them. Right. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Like, like you know, like you know, so, you know, you know, you know, you know how you just, you know, I think it was Steve who said that if you take a triangle and you, you know, and you put like, you inscribe a square, you, you get three separate triangles. Well, right. you know, well, wouldn't you get two separate triangles if you, if you're, if you're doing, if you're using a right angle triangle? Um. Do you, do, do, do I need to find a way to rephrase the question? You know, yeah, I'm looking at an equilateral triangle on my head, and then visualizing the rectangle there. I don't know. It's geometry. We'll have to. I, I honestly, I. Well, I, no, no. I mean, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I asked because you know, the, the because I'm trying to think in my head. You know, a ah! right, a right angle. There we what? go. I lost you guys. I lost you guys for a minute. Okay. The best thing to do. Let me give you a hint. Is to assume. Yeah, in a you rectangle, have a, you have two triangles. Yeah, I can right, see them. Yeah, the best thing to do is to assume that you have a scaling triangle in other words no three of the sides are none of the sides are equal and it's not a right triangle okay ah because you're yeah you're by the way we'll, we'll have to hang on those types of triangles one of these days right. for hog tie yeah because your formula you know, if you he doesn't think if you, triangles exist you're, if, if you can do it with a scaling triangle with the you and the, it's not a right it's not a right triangle right so the three legs of the triangle are no two of them are equal and the uh and none of the angles are equal as well so you've got the, which is a scalene triangle and it's it's not a right triangle so assume that so so you if you've got the three vertices a b and c b will be different from a to c and those two will be different from b to c you got that maybe in your head yeah, yeah, you know, we probably we um I could do basic geometry, but I suck at geometry. But I I, I could explain well, basic is, stuff. But this is actually very simple geometry. Yeah, <laughs> she says. Yeah. No, it <laughs> really is. It really is, and and that's kind of the trick here. The trick is thinking of how to set up the problem because in math, one of the reasons I like this example in math, as, as Steve was saying. The trick is to setting up the equation. Physics is the same way. There, right, because there are a lot of, I did a ton of max min problems in calculus. Yeah, I just, the I haven't really been geometry in a very long time, right? And so yeah. I, I wouldn't well, well, but, right. want to Well, well max min problems stuff. are certainly, yeah, but max min problems certainly aren't just geometry. Max min no, problems no. are everything. No, you, need, you, need different, you, need, yeah. you need to think derivatives, of course. Yeah, but it's taking the derivative is usually the easiest part. Well, but here's the thing: the, the max, the, the Jade. Remember, I mentioned something about the ball bearing and taking measurements. Mm -hmm. Those are a max min problem because you're taking the right. minimum exactly. error measurements to the range of the minimum error measurement to the highest range of the error measurement, and how it propagates right. error propagation to, to extrapolate and to find out what the volume is. So, right. the right. small a small change in, in measurement can lead to a bigger change. Um, after derivative, because you actually take the derivative right. of the volume formula in order right. to do that. So yeah, you're exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, so, but it's it's not the taking the derivative part that's difficult. It's no. the setting the equation up properly yeah. that's, that's difficult. That's where the right. trick comes in, and that's right. why I kind of like this example because it's so general. It 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 works the brain in terms of setting up um the equation. So I I'll put that out there. I'll, um I'll even I'll even do a little drawing. You do that one, with and a, I'll, 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 actually, I'll actually do a little one on the ball bearing one because I've actually had to do that one. That one actually oh, that, was something that, we learned in the military. That, that, you know, the nuke school, you had, you had to, this is why we learned calc in, in the Navy right. um, because they want you to understand error propagation and differentials. Right. And what kind of micrometer did you use? Did, uh, you, did you have a dial on your micrometer uh, or not? They were, I, I used different types actually. There was actually, I had an internal micrometer, right, for, um, uh, if you were like measuring the internal uh, diameter of a pipe, and then you have external. Right. Micrometers, calipers. Well, yeah, yeah, the cal yeah. Well, no, yeah. there's calipers. And well, they're, they're, they're that type. They're, but you know, how a caliper goes on the yeah. outside. Um, a dial micrometer yeah, yeah. will go on the outside, and then you have you have what you can do is you can take internal calipers if you don't have a, the right kind of uh, micrometer. Yeah, I know what those are. 
I yeah. was a machinist. Oh yeah, so yeah, well, yeah, exactly. You know what? I was a machinist man in the Navy. So when you say machinist, so I'm there. like, yes. Um, yeah, we, so, we, yeah we, but you know what I mean—a caliper. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, of reg course. the regular caliper that has the C on it. It looks sort of like a C with a the. a. We we had all yeah we had all you had you got all kinds. I'm yeah, sure, I'm I mean, sure. But, what, um, what 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 part of the preventive maintenance thing for your PMS uh, PMS uh, what's it called the preventive <laughs> the preventive <laughs> scheduling? Yeah. Um, so you have to, you had you had to determine if if it was safe to put a certain amount of pressure in a pipe, right? People, right. people this is why you went to nuke school, by the way. Um, you had to know the theory because anybody can push a button and turn a valve. But you actually have to fix stuff. You have to actually know the concepts because right. who's going to fix this stuff? So I, you would have to determine whether a pipe was safe or not. And you have a minimum thickness, wall thickness, based upon right. what's called the schedule. And the way you would determine that is you'd use like an inter internal caliper and then external caliper. Right. That would give you a, you know, the in the thickness of the wall. And then you would use calculus and stuff like that to determine the, the you know, the minimum maximum. So there's a reason for why they do teach you this stuff in, in, in nuke school. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah, there, we call it theory to practice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, back when I was doing it, uh, dial calipers were actually not as common, and, and dial micrometers were even less common. You know, so you actually had to read the lines. Uh, that's that. But to that, I think that would introduce more of a uh, error propagation. It does. It does. Yeah. It does introduce more of an error propagation, yeah. which is why, for our really sensitive stuff, we used an optical comparator. How much were those? Expensive. There was like one per department. Oh. And you had. Yeah, I use. I've, I've used the dial. I've never used an optical comparator. But I've used the dial type. I've used the C yeah. type of micrometer, where you have you know yeah. that you know, that the little thing goes in and out. Oh man, I can use those one-handed so fast. I still can. That was actually a very common way. For example, when when yeah. you would use, when, if I wanted to take the the volume of a mic of a ball bearing, right, or something yes. like that, you would use that type. Yes, right? that's the easiest. And kind the reason why you take that, you know, why you use that type though, you was preferred over just like a like a like a just just a th think of a simple caliper, right? Yeah. That only gives you a point on one point of contact with the ball right. bearing, but the type of you're talking about, that C clamp type, yeah, the surface area is a little bit greater. It gives you a little bit more. Yeah. It's not I mean, again, it's 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 not that great. It still has a small point of contact, but the point of contact is generally a little bit larger than just a small point. But again, right. that's so fine that unless you're doing with fine tuning measurements, who cares, right? Yeah. See, we were making we were making. Uh, um, uh, don't you just love it when the mind goes blank? Uh, yeah. And by the way, you use that for more to just spherical objects too. Right. You use it for um, for square type objects as well. And that's right. why I'm talking about the. You have more surface area on those type for point of contact. But I was just going to tell you what we what we made, and, and my mind just decided to hide it. Um, <laughs> but basically, you know, you know, you know, like you have a plug, right? Yeah. You know, like a really complex plug, and you have the little metal parts in the plug that that connect connectors connectors. It was, it was a connector company. So we made these connectors, and some of them were very small. So you would have to measure the connector. And what you're talking about, like, I take a micrometer in one hand, and I take the part in another hand, and the part would be just a few centimeters long. And you you check it, and then you turn it, and then you check it, and then you turn it, and then you check it, and then you turn it. Yeah, you're taking your two, yeah, X axis, Y axis, Z axis. You're taking different measurements right. across different axis, so you get an average. Right. Right, right. So you make are, sure are you checking you if they want a specific measurement for each axis sure right so you make you make sure it's within uh you know that, yeah within tolerance so yeah. that, that none of those were yeah and we we dealt with plus or minus uh hundreds usually if we were dealing with plus or minus thousands that's when we went to the yeah that's what i was saying comparator. before the micrometer is generally 0 0.01 but some of the yeah. the more sensitive ones are 0 0.001 which would be in the thousands right right yeah. it depended on what kind of parts we were using if we use the uh the actual contacts themselves were very had to be really really close. They had to be within hundreds at least, or thousands. Yeah. Um, the um, if we're dealing with something like a, um, you know, the outside of the plug. If you start talking in. about interferometers, I'm leaving. Interferometers, <laughs> but you know what? Okay, well, I, gotta, I, gotta yeah, end, I actually got to end this. But you know what? Yeah. Yeah. This goes. To, this goes to what's the difference between theory and practice, right? Obviously, Jade and myself, we've done this in practice, right? Um, yeah. So. The theory is actually applied in real world applications, right? And this is why the people that always have saying, "Oh, well, the Great Debate Community or Steve's Channel, or whatever," they never talk about actual science, or they never educate, or they don't have any experience, or they don't know anything. You know, it's just like 
we have to have the experience okay <laughs> i mean i can tell you right now jay knows about machinery you know machinist stuff because she Clearly, she knows what she's talking about because she's done this, right? I've done. I've worked with commoners too, um, so yeah. I just think it's funny. I, I I still get a kick out of it. I always get a kick out of it because it's like, for God's sake, you know, you can't you can't just you, you can't just learn stuff uh, by reading, reading Wikipedia. Yeah, it helps. Don't get me wrong, but it's, it's you can't do it. You're not going to be a Wikipedia expert. But anyways, guys, uh, let's end this because we we we've gone long. Yeah. Uh, we'll get in the chain rule tomorrow at some point, maybe. But again, tomorrow we also have a debate with King Crocoduck and Wayne Fillmore, so it might be when? might be when? postponed for uh, other things. Um, that's going to be at twelve thirty tomorrow. Wait, hold on, twelve thirty your time? Yeah, Pacific. So three thirty. Three thirty Eastern. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. Which channel here or yours? No, mine. Okay, sorry, Jade. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Yeah. I said I'd probably be outside for that during that one, depending oh. on the weather. And then, of course, we have to have an after show. So, uh, I mean, the chain rule might have to wait till like Monday because I got the Sunday show on Sunday or, or Sunday night, or you know what, maybe Saturday night. I don't know. We'll see. But it's good. But yeah, I want the chain rule to be at a separate uh, hangout because it, it 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 really is the most important formula or whatever in um in calculus, yeah, I think. Important rule, yes. Yeah, it's really, really critical. If you don't get down the chain rule, you're just going to be SOL. Right. So anyways, guys, RIC, Midnight, Jade, Barney, who else we got? Kowser, Charles, everybody in the live chat. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. Um, and I hope you guys re you know remembered something. This is a good review. If you've never been exposed to this before, you know, go run with it. So if you ever do yep. any of these classes, you're, you're going to have a leg up. So with that, guys, um,